Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. This episode is brought to you guys by NeuroGum, an all-new nootropic gum that enhances focus and boosts your metabolism and attention all naturally. Back their Indiegogo campaign today at NeuroGum.com. Greetings, super friends, and welcome back to part two of my two-hour, two-part live Q&A with Dr. Anthony Mativier on all things learning, memory, and life. If you haven't listened to the first one-part portion of this episode, I suggest you do that first. But hey, it's totally up to you if you want to listen to them out of order. In any case, we're going to dive right back in. So here is my live Q&A part two with Dr. Anthony Mativier. Give us something good. I've got a cue for both Jonathan and Anthony combined. Let's say you want to master a textbook for tomorrow's exam. Now a speed reading. We already answered that. We answered that, dude. You didn't like the first answer. Hey, dig in. The answer is you're screwed, man. <laughs> dig your wells before you're thirsty. I'm just kidding. Vsebt, we love you. Entrepreneur, do you share the link, please? We will. will. We will. We will. I shall. I'm sure you're following us. What is your opinion about Lumosity, the website based on neuroplastic method? How effective is such method? So we have a lot of games in our course. And actually, Tim Ferriss just did a really nice podcast with the Maverick of Brain Optimization. There's a lot of research that games really, really work for the brain in terms of optimizing it and its performance. I've played with Lumosity a little bit. I know they're actually pretty research heavy. They check what they do and they deliver apparently on really scientifically backed. So I say, if you enjoy it, go for it. I do not enjoy it. I don't enjoy spending any more time on my smartphone than I need to. So I don't do that. My thing is the same, but a little bit different. And it's what I talked about before. Uh People were asking about becoming more creative and uh, having better images and so forth. Now, Luminosity and all of its competitors... They can give you these abstract games that are supposedly going to create your creativity and create and uh, improve your reflexes, and all that stuff, all yeah. that sort of stuff. But why not create those games for yourself? And why not do your own mental Olympics based on what you created? Free. Yeah. It's not only free, but you're the creator and you can choose the output and the input. And so what you do instead of playing a game is you go and find someone and you play Dungeons and Dragons with them. Or you go and find someone and you play chess with them. Or you go and find somebody else and you interact with human beings because those create chemicals point. in your brain, right? That's a good point. So why sit there, da 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 in your own head, synced with a machine, when you can either be doing it yourself with your own creativity, your own imagination, messing around with things, reading novels, imagining the novels, writing your own stories, or just going and interacting with other human beings. That's what's yeah. missing in the world. That's what the market for oh luminosity God. is filling. Look what has just They're happened. filling the void of Ladies emptiness. Ladies and gentlemen, a crime. They're- a crime has been committed. <laughs> and I am the guilty party. Oh, yeah. Well, you're even more guilty because that bottle is empty. That bottle is tapped. And I don't think you have a plan. I have a plan. Oh, you got a plan. I have okay. a plan. But you know what I'm trying to say? I'm not going to speak against any of these programs, but I feel that in general, they are not about what they are about. They are about filling the gap of loneliness that has been created more and more and more hmm. over time. And you know what? Everybody was lonely even in ancient China. Whatever. But the whole thing is is that we don't have to be. We can use the technology to meet each other. We don't need the technology to sit there and be inside of our mind. It's called solipsism when you are just simply sitting by yourself playing games in your mind. So go and meet other people. So I'll say, yeah, I mean, I spoke my piece on, on Lumosity already. I think, look, there's something to be said about brain exercises. And if Lumosity is what gets people doing it, great. It's just like I always say, if headspace or calm is what gets you meditating, fine. You know what I mean? It's what got me meditating. Now I meditate without it. But Oh, sure. In that sense. Yeah. If it gets you doing it, awesome. I, I think Lumosity's programs are great. But I think what Anthony says is completely true, which is intellectually stimulating conversation with other human beings is always going to be number one. Yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is kind of like, 
the exercise version. There's the exercise machine that you have in your house where you're uh-huh. never going to meet anybody. Mm-hmm. And then there's the exercise machine that you have at the gym where at least you have the potential of meeting someone or at least you have yeah. the chemical brain effects of seeing someone that you'd like to meet. If you Though as a what CrossFit I'm diehard, I'm obligated to say, avoid the gym machine, <laughs> but go throw tires. Whatever. Just go do it with people. You know? Just go do um, things. It's just a, just a metaphor, but you're not going to lift weights uh, Correct. with your brain as successfully on your own. Essentially. This is a question that comes up so much. Can you reuse memory palaces? Yeah, that one's a big one. You want to go first? or You are the memory palace man. I am the man. Okay, well, here's the thing. And here's the real answer. The answer of all answers. Before you can even ask that question, you need to be able to use memory palaces effectively <laughs> in the first place. And so when you've done that, you'll already know the answer to the question. And I, I'm not going to leave it at that because that's just a oh. silly mystery kind of guy thing. But the reality is, is that it's situational. It has to do with the subject. It has to do with the purpose and the reason for using the memory palace in the first place. But yes, you can reuse memory palaces, but the extent to which you will be successful in reusing them has everything to do with the extent to which you already know how to use memory palaces as such. Bingo. So sneak peek. Uh, most people who win memory championships use the exact same memory palace for, you know, they have the, the memory palace for speed cards. They have the memory palace for names and faces, and they literally spend a week after clearing out the memory palace. Yeah. So yes, you can. I actually don't personally recommend reusing them except for under certain circumstances, because I think that you do much speaking of luminosity apps and mental exercise, I think you do so much more for yourself when you're constantly seeking and striving to find and use new memory palaces. But I reuse memory palaces all the time. But again, it comes back to the same thing. The extent to which reusing a memory palace is effective is the extent to which you know how to use a memory palace as such. Fair. Just learn the basics. It's like black belt or a green, white belt, orange belt, all the way up to black belt. What is black belt except for a higher level of repetition of, I don't know. I was in Sistema for my martial arts. I I shouldn't be making... Isn't that? That's an Israeli martial art. No, Krav Maga is Israeli. Krav Maga and also... No. Oh, God. Denise. Denise Denise Survival. Sistema is Russian. Sistema is Russian. And that's what I did. I know I had some association to it. I just couldn't figure out which one. We don't have belts. We just have... Guy who teaches students who teach system. the teacher. Yeah, yeah. system. It's very good. I like system. Uh, but I've practiced it in three different cities and three different uh, clubs, and it's awesome. And it has no belts, it has no bowing, and so forth. And each of those, incidentally, places where I practice are memory palaces, but I never reuse them because they don't need to be reused. So Check I don't this. know if that's answering the question, but I just, I think the answer really is, is that the extent to which you'll know the answer to the question is the extent to which you know how to use memory palaces. True story. Can you effectively absorb, how can you effectively absorb lots of information given at a conference or like this lecture? All right. Mm. First thing, which I think is really great because Anthony and I both agree with this. It's that whether or not you have super learning and super wonderful memory ability skill, there's no shame in taking notes no. because that process, actually, you said a really nice thing today. We're working on a course and Anthony gave this whole spiel, which I really loved about when you write something down and when you write and you form it into your own words, you interact with the content in a different way. And that's something we talk about in super learner, engage with the information use the information. If you're going to learn a language, don't sit in your bedroom and listen to audio tapes, go out, use the language, play with it. So if you're sitting at home right now watching this meerkat and you're taking notes, you're putting them in your own words. You're telling your brain, this is relevant information for me so much so that I've decided to take my own words and reform it into a thought. With that said, I personally would form visual symbols around every concept. So, you know, I'd form a visual symbol around multiplication tables. Boom, I already have one, right? Yeah. And I'd form a visual symbol because you mentioned, you know, Aristotle and being able to recite his poetry. So I have a visual symbol for that. I, at this point, you know, four years on to having the skill, I see the world in visual symbols. And if you were to tell me, you know, hey, Jonathan, I'm translating my book to Portuguese, boom, map of Brazil instantly comes up to me. Yeah. And that's where you want to get because next time when I talk to Anthony, I'm just going to think of all these images. They just come up. I don't have to even conjure them up. It's just, you know, Anthony was talking to me about this Portuguese translation. He was talking to me about this consultant that he met with. I have all these images. 
the thing that I would like to add to this, if you do want to train to be able to memorize in real time using a memory palace, for example, uh-huh. there are all kinds of things you can do. Like you can download a TED talk, you can turn it into an MP3 and you can slow it down so that you have a memory palace prepared in advance. You know that from this TED talk, you want to memorize 10 pieces of information, 10 things the person said, maybe three things you want to memorize that they said verbatim, so it's word for word. You slow it down and you practice making the images in real time. And then you can speed it up over time. A lot of memory champions, they will work with a metronome. And that's another thing that you can do in order to practice memorizing in real time. But I think at the end of the day, if you want to be able to go into a lecture and just pick out the key things in real time at the speed that I'm speaking now or even faster that some people speak, you just take TED Talks, podcasts, whatever, and you slow them down and you listen to them slowly and you have a memory palace prepared in advance. You have a number of items that you want to memorize prepared in advance, like three things, ten things, whatever number you pick. You can roll the dice and pick the number that's on the dice. And you just listen slowly and you practice creating images that you stick on a station in a memory palace as you hear it roll by. And then you test yourself later and you can go back and listen again at normal speed or at two times speed, whatever your device does for you. And you can practice that. And that's really good actually to do because as uh, my friend Jim Samuels says, he uh, wrote a book called Remind Yourself. You really got to check it out. He talks about the power of being able to memorize in real time when you're having an argument with someone. Now, people like us, we rarely have arguments with people, but it does happen. And so imagine the ability to actually memorize the main points that people are saying as they're saying it and repeating it back to them piece by piece when you're making your rebuttal. That argument isn't going to last for long. So practice that if you're interested in it and read Jim Samuel's book, Remind Yourself, because he goes into that in greater detail. And if you go to magneticmemorymethod.com and you search the name Jim Samuels, you'll hear my interview with him where he talks about that. And it's just an amazing interview. He's an amazing guy. And Jim, if you're listening, hello. We haven't uh, emailed for a while, but I got to shoot, awesome. shoot you a note. Yes. You're awesome. You're awesome. You're an awesome human. And I really, really love that book, Remind Yourself, so much. It's taking mnemonics into the world of relaxation, into the world of personal transformation, into self-improvement. I talk about that stuff a little bit, which is why we connected so much. But it's just absolutely fantastic what you can do. And you can really memorize arguments in real time and repeat stuff back. Someone made a really interesting statement, question, slash point, where they said... In the moment, they feel dumb when being questioned. They face difficulty answering a question to the fact I know. Now, there's a couple of things that could be happening here. One, you could be facing just some mental fog, which could be diet related. But more than likely, there's an element of attention or confidence issue here, potentially, which I don't know if we want to get into. But I think, first and foremost, Focusing and paying attention and listening to people is a most important skill. But one of the most valuable tricks that I've ever learned is, and my mother taught me this, it's called the pregnant pause. Mm. And what it means, you think that if you ask me a question and I'm silent for three seconds, you think it's going to be the most excruciating, awful thing that's ever happened. But in fact, it adds this depth and this power to your speaking. Okay. So if you ask me a question, what do you think about the term pregnant constructio? Hmm. Well, I'd have to be honest with you and say that, you know, <laughs> well, actually a pregnant constructio means a pregnant pause that's pregnant about to pause. be constructed into a meaningful answer. That's, Bingo. Why, I it, that's why I pulled it out of my uh, long, exact long, so I didn't my know long that. tail. I'm learning. You're knowledge. learning. We're learning. <laughs> We're all learning. Everybody's <laughs> learning. Everyone's learning about learning. Meta learning. That's my next course. Become a meta learner. <laughs> Learn about learning and then teach it on the internet. But I want to answer the sleeping habits question too. Oh yeah. Well, uh, by the way, I have a new book coming out called the ultimate sleep remedy. So hashtag plug. <laughs> hashtag. But yes. it's really his territory. <laughs> hashtag plugs. <laughs> all right. Practice the pregnant pause and practice becoming comfortable with silence. Because then you won't have to say things like, um, or, you know, and your words will carry more weight. And when they carry more weight in reality, 
you're taking time to think and form your words. And there's nothing wrong with premeditating your sentences. Let's answer the sleep question. What are your sleep habits? Do you think someone can incorporate Dimaxion or Uberman every man into super learning regimen? You want me to take this? I'll take this. So I just interviewed. We could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Do you got time? I got time. I don't have to be somewhere until like 9, 930. The show will go on, ladies and gentlemen. This one here? Yeah. Let's do that. There's a bottle opener in the cabinet over there. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Anthony Mativier, multifaceted, multi-skilled gentleman, plays the guitar, card tricks, memory master, PhD. Also, wonderful host, hosting me in my own home. Opening a bottle of wine. All right, sleep habits. So I interviewed Dr. Kirk Parsley, who is the sleep expert. He works with the Navy SEALs, and he knows essentially everything there is to know about how sleep affects performance, and performance is dependent on sleep and all these great things, okay? He and I agree on the key point here, which is your brain needs sleep. And we don't know. There's probably hundreds of functions that sleep serves besides repairing the muscles and all this stuff and metabolite clearance in the brain. Pause. Choose your words carefully. All right. But he and I both agree. You can accelerate learning by sleeping more than once a day. How, you ask? Well, every time you sleep, you're essentially moving. And I can't prove this with scientific evidence, but it's kind of generally well understood and observed. Every time you sleep, you're moving things from short-term memory to long-term memory. Your brain is building neurons, connecting them with synapses. Great. Fantastical. Okay. If then you read a book at 11 a.m., as sometimes I do, sometimes I eat lunch with a book, and you devour a ton of content, and then you eat lunch, and then you go to sleep, you've just moved that information from short-term memory to long-term memory. And if you do this once or twice a day, then you are now more effectively moving things out of this buffer, this short-term memory is limited, you are moving them and essentially you're doubling your capacity to learn. So he talks about how he, I forget which martial arts, I believe it's judo that he does, but people are astounded at his learning capability. And, you know, he hasn't taken my course yet that I know of. And he says, look, I take a nap. Like I train, I learn something, I build all this muscle memory and I tell my brain that I need to create these new neurons. And then I go take a nap. If you ask my Russian language partner, who I talk to almost every week, he will know that literally every time we're finishing the conversation, I'm like wrapping up, getting into bed and taking a nap because I learned so much in that one hour conversation. The first thing I want to do is sleep. So I'm answering your question in a very long roundabout fashion, but I sleep six hours at night. I sleep 20 minutes during the day. That's it. It's very nice. Yeah. The only thing I would add, hashtag plug from the ultimate sleep remedy is that I teach, <laughs> I teach uh, something that's been, uh, someone's asking me about dealing with depression here. So that's why I also want to talk about this. We share that. You and I. You have depression also? Had. Had? Uh, okay. Very, very like deep depression for five or six years. Well, he's lucky to say had. I still deal with this a mm-hmm. lot, actually. And one of the number one things that has helped me is what I talk about in the ultimate sleep remedy, which is called Shavasana. And Shavasana, you know what? Is it similar to Vipassana? I don't know, but... uh, Let's find out. No, no. Ladies and gentlemen. It's not really... No, I mean, it's basically corpse pose is how it translates. And uh, what I've done is to simply modify it, I guess, for sleeping. So I just lay down on my back. I've trained myself using progressive muscle relaxation to become extraordinarily comfortable oh, with you, not moving. You mentioned this. Not moving. And it takes a while, but when you can train yourself to become relaxed with not moving, you will begin to become much more aware in ways that are absolutely extraordinary, and you also begin to fall asleep a lot better. And another thing that's helped me is develop dream recall, because... I don't have any some special reason, but it just helped my depressions a lot when I can remember my dreams a lot. And the other thing about dealing with depression is that I write down almost on a daily basis, about 80% of the time, I write down some kind of vision statement of where I want my future to go. And I also write down 10 things that I'm grateful for. And these help a lot all together. So it's actually the way that I bring myself into sleep. It's the way that I wake myself up and it's the gratitude and the journaling that I do that has made all the difference in the world and meditating, actual strict meditating, which is sitting meditation on the floor. And, you know, Tim Ferriss was talking about this not so long ago on one of his podcasts that 
everybody who's successful that he can think yeah. of it has all some kind of There's meditation like three things routine. in common they meditate they read and they exercise yeah which by the way i think honestly is one of the greatest treatments for depression at least for me exercise like it is natural what's the one not xanax you know, you well, know the one I'm yeah, thinking yeah, yeah. of. Exercise is natural, good feeling. Na- yeah, it's natural <laughs> antidepressant. Yeah, yeah. So someone's talking about depression during the learning process, as in progress being slower than you think it should be. And also, does stress reduce the memory performance? And is there a way to deal with stress? Meditation is a yeah. great way to deal with stress. Exercise and sex, also great. All of these things in the brain play out with the same chemicals, the serotonins, the dopamines, all that great stuff that your body needs and um look exercise is one of the best antidepressants i've encountered sure in terms of managing stress i think it's important at least in my life i haven't been stressed in years and i'll tell you why because this is going to sound ridiculous but i realized that nothing is that important at all ever Mm. period Mm. i mean like go to the extreme even my health Could I be happy if I were terminally ill? God forbid. Probably. Like, it's all a matter of choosing to be happy and choosing to be calm and choosing not to be stressed. And it sounds ridiculous when I crystallize it into this because this, we're talking about six years of deep work on myself to be able to say, yeah, okay, you know. Well, yeah, yeah, I want to add to this because I do have this thing. It just weeks before I came to London and then to Tel Aviv, it was like really dark and really nasty thoughts and all kinds of stuff. And because of meditation, because of all this stuff, it's similar to what Jonathan said. The first thing is, is that I recognize that it's going to pass and I'm able to be present to it because of my yes. meditation practice. And when you're present to it, you just realize, you know, you see a cloud in the sky and you know the rain is coming. You don't like shake your fist at it and say, oh, I wish the rain was going to go away. You just say, hey, it's going to rain, whatever, no big deal. It's kind of got to build that distance between sure. what's going on with your mental situation and so on. But another thing that really helped me is basically what he just said, is that it's not that important. Nothing is. The way that I visualize this, and I remind myself about it a lot of the time, is that in human history, there has been so much extraordinary suffering, right? That this little speck, oh, and let's talk about the future too. All the extraordinary suffering yet to come, (laughs) this little speck of my life and all my little aches and pains and even the most dastardly things that could come to pass in my life, which most likely never will come, so there's no point in worrying about them. In Hebrew, as we say, Bezrat Hashem, with the help of God. Yeah. It's nothing, man. And you know what you need to read? You need to read a book called Better Never to Have Existed. And that is by a guy named David Benatar. Now, this is not easy reading. It's not all that pleasant. But I really think that you're going to feel a lot better about your depression if you go and read Better to Never Have Existed. And it's just, I'm not going to get into it that much, but yeah. it just changed my life so much in so many ways. And it's not really a downer. It sounds like a downer book. It sounds like a downer But you've got to look up a podcast interview that he gave, and you'll hear just what a happy and extraordinarily interesting guy that he is. But basically, the proof is, is that suffering will always, always, always eternally outweigh pleasure. And that's why... If you're going to have to exist, you just got to realize that suffering that you experience in your life is nothing. And also like uh, compared to what it could be. So just (laughs) chill out. And also it's a choice. Exactly. Chill out. Enjoy it. And it's a choice. I really honestly believe, and I've spent a fair bit of time studying Buddhism and studying a lot of things. I used to study how happiness works because I didn't understand how someone could be happy. This is like how I spend my adolescent years. Happiness is a choice. In any case... The question was, does stress reduce memory performance? Yes. Stress pumps cortisol into your brain. You can tell I spend a lot of time thinking about brain chemistry and what chemicals are going through my brain right now. And stress pumps cortisol into your brain and into your body. It reduces blood flow. It increases blood pressure. It does all these terrible things. So try not to be stressed. You don't need to be. You don't need to be. When are we doing another course on Udemy? Right now. That's why We're doing it right now. Now That's we've been working on it all day, which is why we had to get drunk to forget. <laughs> he's drunk. I don't know. I'm a little is. drunk. I don't know what he's talking. I about. I drink drunk. like once a month, and then this happens, and then well, I'm like, I'm never gonna drink again. When he says he drinks once a month, that makes me sound bad. But uh, <laughs> and he's gonna pour me another glass anyway. No, uh, we're doing another course right now. It it's is a course. Though. It's very different, I think, actually. But actually, it's the same. It's related. It's called branding you. How to build. What title did we come up with? 
Branding you, building a, a multi-channel. <laughs> we went through so many titles and I memorized them all. Branding you, building a multimedia internet ecosystem. That's right. And it's going to teach you guys to do what we what do. What we do so that you can have this view and you can hang out and you can talk to people and you can help people for a living. And, and tap glasses. Do, so. And tap glasses. And it's just a lot of fun because mm. we've accomplished more than, at least I've accomplished more than I ever thought would be possible when I lost my last research grant and basically... That wine might be corked. <laughs> Taste oh. it. Let me know what you think. Oh, well, okay. Oh, it's a Shiraz, so... That is definitely Shirazi. But you know what? Yeah. I like it. I think it's nice. It's funny because Shiraz is a Persian word for I forget what. Oh, and I'm Persian. My father's Persian. <laughs> All right, guys, let me just hit pause really quickly to let you all know about this episode's sponsor. As you guys already know, I'm a big, big fan of nootropics. I've tried probably 50 or so different pills and potions for increased concentration, but only recently have I discovered a nootropic gum. It's called NeuroGum, and unlike the boring old caffeinated gum I used to chew in the 90s, this stuff has L-theanine. Now, you may remember L-theanine from our episode with Dr. Andrew Hill, who discussed its nootropic and calming effects at length. When you consider that chewing gum has also been proven to increase focus, boost metabolism, reduce dental plaque and cavities, and possibly even make you more physically attractive to potential mates, it's definitely worth working neurogum into your normal nootropic routines. I've been chewing on it and I love its fast effects and calming energy. So I really recommend you guys order yours today at neurogum.com. That's N E U R O G U M.com and get an early adopter discount. All right. I, this question has come up a couple of times. Okay, Sorry. Sorry. Can we? We have a new course. Let's do it. We have it, a new course. It, it's it. going to teach you how to build an internet brand, Back to how to share your wonderful lessons. Uh, working on myself to reduce the effects of stress, sleep, deprivation due to three kids. Oof. My medical condition that causes me to have chronic pain and ADHD. Any tips for ADHD? Oh, this is all me. This is all me. All right. I'm going to share a little bit of something, which I haven't shared in the past. I have ADHD. I'm medicated for ADHD. Do I always medicate for ADHD? Pretty often. Does it help me where it wouldn't help someone like Anthony who has his own psychological profile? Maybe not, maybe yes. I'm a big advocate that if you have a problem and modern medicine can help you, go for it. With that said, if I had high blood pressure, would I go on Lipitor right away? Maybe not. But um, can I supplement Yerba Mate for Adderall or Ritalin? Maybe yes. My point is that ADHD basically means that Sorry, my mother is asking for the link, which means we're going to have to clean up our act. Maybe I'll take over for just a second. Yeah, yeah, uh, please. I, I don't think that I have ADHD, but I have to take pills, and it'd be insane not to. And Oh, you do? What do you take? I have Can to we take, share that? Yeah, I have to take Lamictal, which is also called Lamotrigine. It's a mood stabilizer, Okay. and uh, it's also used for epilepsy. So essentially what it does, when you have bipolar disorder, the positive and negative ions that go through the synapses between the neurons in the brain, they are not going at the proper speeds. They're either going too fast or too slow. Mm. So what the Motrogene or Lamictal does is it regulates that speed. Problem with me is, and this is why memory techniques have been so extraordinary, is that it is not good for your memory. It's not good for your general comprehension. And that's why I go on and on and on about how powerful they've been for me because I would never have gotten through grad school. I would never have learned languages. I would never do anything without it because it's just a mess here. And yet I need to take that pill. You know, Iron Man, he's got that thing on his chest and it's pulling those, yeah. that magnet. Yeah. I mean, this is a metaphor for life in many things that a lot of us face, but that's essentially what people that have yeah, yeah. these things. And so, Jonathan's right. If you have a medical thing and science can help provide it, it's always going to have its dark side. It's going to have yes. kryptonite and so on, but just don't piss around with suffering. That's unnecessary. Agreed. And Agreed. Just, just, which uh, raises a really good point, but go see um, your doctor before taking any of it. Exactly. Risk. Which raises a good point. And now my mother is apparently on the feed. I just got a text message. Uh oh. So I'm going to tell a story about my mother. Okay. She's a wonderful mother. Hi mom. My mom I, I, is my, how does this thing work? <laughs> How does it get everyone's mom on the feed? When hey, I had is that a, Obama's mom? I had a girlfriend in college who convinced me, you know, you don't need this stuff and it's unnatural and don't put it in your body. And of course, I was madly in love with this woman. And so I listened to everything she said. And I came home 
And I was like, I'm going off. I'm going off the Ritalin. And my mom said, so if you get diabetes, is she going to get you off the insulin too? Mm. And I had to sit back and I had to go, well, I guess not. So why would you go off the medication? Does it help you or does it not help you? It helps me. Yeah. In short, yeah, I, I take my medication almost every day. Someone asked again about nootropics, which is my favorite topic in the world. We covered it listen right now. Replay, yeah, listen to the replay. Right now, I'm jamming on the yerba mate. I really love it. I discovered yesterday, not good to work out on it. Uh, no, yeah. Really bad. It slows your heart rate, dilates your blood vessels. Not good. But I love the mate. I have experimented a little bit recently with the press tam. I have some more stuff in the mail coming. But honestly, because I medicate for ADD, I don't mess around with too much other stuff. I don't screw around with coffee even. I'm a traditional you know, guy. Uh, I, I want to jump in on something because the story yeah. that you told about your mother and if you had uh, diabetes, would you stop taking insulin and so forth? When I first got ill with manic depression, or I was probably ill with it a long time, but the first time I had to be hospitalized for that, oh, wow. I was in there for three months. And I did not want to take lithium. At that time, lithium was what I took. Now I take uh, what I mentioned before. But I did not want to take it. And that's why I had to stay in the hospital for so long because they weren't going to let me out of there because I was raving like a lunatic. I had ideas about how zero could be pulled apart to be the number one and number could be bent, whatever. It was crazy. And the one day the guy finally said to me, he said, exactly this thing with diabetes. He said, you know, the actor, Will Robin Williams, he has bipolar disorder and he's a very, very successful person. You do not have to worry about your brilliant thoughts because that was what I was worried about. They're going to give me the pill. I'm not going to be myself. I'm not going to have great thoughts. Right. I'm going to have ideas. And he said, Robin Williams has the same condition that you have. And you just take the pill. It's not going to change you. It's just going to balance you out and so forth. But if he had diabetes, do you think he would not take insulin? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's a similar kind of yeah. thing. And Maybe given the last year's events less than ideal example. Well, no, but, but I have a podcast on magneticmemorymethod.com where I talk about Robin Williams. I talk about this exact same thing. And what happened to Robin Williams is not just about bipolar disorder. He was also diagnosed with a disease that was basically terminal. And, uh, and so, that, yeah. So, you know, we can't say that what happened in that moment when I was in the hospital, that doctor giving that example it, and what Robin Williams ultimately did with his existence, they're not the same thing. But at the end of the day, I just wanted to share that celebrity is aside, it was this sort of similar thing. Would you not take insulin if you had diabetes? So Yeah, and I want to come back. I feel like I started this point and I didn't finish it because something happened. Maybe the sushi came or something like that. I think a lot about what our brains are evolved to do. And mm -hmm. I think a lot about what our bodies are evolved to do. And basically, I took that point. Now my memory is kicking in. I took that point in the direction of use these memory palaces, use visual memories, because that's what our brains are evolved to do. But the point that I wanted to actually make, if you think your brain is evolved to sit at a desk from nine to five or longer, you're delusional. Like, no, your brain is evolved to hunt and mate and all these wonderful, like, natural activities. So essentially, all this stuff, nootropics, memory techniques, focus. What's the site you use? Focus at will.com. Music that makes your brain sit and focus on the same thing. Anthony swears by it. All this stuff is trying to shoehorn this brain of ours into one very specific finite task, which is sitting at a desk and working on a computer or sitting in customer service and answering the phone, whatever you do. 99.999%, unless you're a professional hunter or fisherman, you're not doing what your brain's designed to do. And so my point there is experiment with nootropics, experiment with standing desks, experiment with exercise, Experiment with all these wonderful things that put your brain back into its normal functioning mode and acknowledge the fact that sitting at a desk is not what you are built to do as a human being. Yeah. And you know, we're on that note, I'm going to stand up Yeah, for a sec. I managed to stand up because I was uncorking wine, but yeah. uh, <laughs> I don't know if I was evolved to drink wine either. But here's the thing, though, that's exciting about all that is that as human beings, we're in a moment. It started some time ago. Different theorists have different ideas about exactly when this started, but we are at a moment where we are self-directing our own evolution, and that's really exciting. Some people think that it started when we invented eyeglasses, because eyeglasses over generations, apparently, I mean, this is a theory, I'm not saying this is true or not. But you but got against eyeglasses. <laughs> I, 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 you know, when I was a kid, I always wished that I had eyeglasses. I even went to the optometrist and begged to the point that they gave them to me, but then I found out I didn't look better than them, so I gave it up. But nonetheless, you look absolutely 
absolutely smashing. Dashing, sir. Dashing. Thank dashing. you. Uh, Thank you, Ducky. I think I'd like to see you in a smoking jacket as oh, soon as possible. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> halfway there. Anyway, the whole thing is, is that also people have said that cars are part of humans self-directing their evolution. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Well, the whole point is, is that we are changing, but not nearly as fast Bingo. as... Uh, would accommodate the things that are going on around us. So do you see that push notification of my mother telling me, take your hand away from your face? <laughs> what? Yeah. I love it. Thank you, mom. <laughs> you're right. What would my mom say if she was here? Oh, Anthony, you're <laughs> embarrassing me. She'd say, well, she'd say, I don't know. She'd probably say something about how I need to brush my hair. <laughs> I interrupted your point. Uh, I think that my point was to compliment yours by saying, well, thank you, sir. we're not designed to be doing what we're doing these days, but mm-hmm. Also, to compliment your point that there are all kinds of optimization strategies that you can take that will actually allow you in a healthy way, in an optimal way, mm-hmm. to incorporate the possibilities that are presented by these technologies that are changing our evolution, that are helping us right. self-direct right. our evolution. So you can survive it, essentially, because as we are able to live longer and longer and longer, our ability to suffer increases in depth and length and duration. And so... Now is the time to start listening. I mean, the, the comparison of the health, physical health of, of Jonathan to me is astounding. And I'm going to like hire him to be my health consultant. <laughs> I actually want to move here so he can just take me to the gym and stuff. To be fair, my gym is 50 meters <laughs> that way. It's yeah, quite and, convenient. To and get to be it, fair, I live in Germany. So when you email them and say, hey, can I get a personal trainer? They don't email you back. Nine. Nine. <laughs> no, you cannot do that. <laughs> I don't know why they never email me back. I'm such a stubborn 21st century person that I will not pick up the phone. And when a company won't email me back, I just like game over. So we got a lot of stuff coming in here. You want to answer some more? Yeah, I want to answer some more. I mean, what else are we going to do? I want to answer this actor. Yeah, yeah. I'm an actor. I can't get lost in my palace during performance, but I need to memorize verbatim. How can I make memory palaces work for me without taking me out of the moment to moment work? That's a good question. It's a good question. It's easy to answer also. A lot of people see the memory palace as something where you're going to access the information from the memory palace in real time. Right. Absolutely possible. Absolutely an option. Not a good idea in most However, situations. Uh, go on. No, no, please. No, I really don't think it's a good idea in any situation. So when you're going to take an exam, yeah, okay, you got all the stuff in the memory palace. Yeah, okay, you can go to that place, but you want to use the memory palace to rehearse the information to the right. extent that you don't need the memory big palace. Up. Now yeah. that sounds like a big operation for nothing, but it isn't, it's no. awesome. So in the case of being an actor, depending on what it is that you're doing, if you're acting on stage, if you're acting for movies or whatever the case may be, you also have so many advantages that people studying for a medical examination don't have. For example, you can think about, does your character lead with their head? Do they lead with their chest? Do they lead with their hips? What kind of vocal intonations are going to be? What are the other characters sure. doing? Where are they standing? What's the blocking and so forth? So you can actually map your memory palace or your location-based memorization strategy onto what the character is doing, how they're doing it, and with whom are they doing it. Sure. And so those are the kinds of things that you rehearse beforehand using the memory techniques before you get to that moment of performance. The other thing is, and this is really, really important, you should go to masterclass.com and you should take Dustin Hoffman's course on acting because he says some extraordinary things about memory. For example, Hoffman writes out his scripts again and again and again until he has them in memory. And I don't know why he chooses it to do that way, but he says, that's what I do and I do it, period. Period. He talks about how... De Niro has no problem sitting with an index card in his hand and just reading what's on the index card and cut You talking to me? Cut action. You talking to me? The thing is, is that you have to think about what the craft of acting is. Is the craft of acting memory or is it the actual presentation of someone embedded in a moment? And as, as Hoffman says... You have often prepared in your mind what you're going to say before you're called upon to say it. So what difference does it make whether you've memorized it as an actor or you've got it on an index card? And Brando, and I knew this from years ago, and it was a real sticking point for Richard Donner, who directed the Superman movies. Donner couldn't get it through his head that Brando insisted. He insisted that around the set of Superman, where he was Jor-El and all this stuff in uh, Superman land there uh, on Krypton, Krypton. he had his lines on paper. 
distributed all around the set. He would not memorize them. He would just read them from where they were on the set. Richard Donner couldn't get it through his head. Wow. But that was Brando's process. Why memorize something when you don't need to memorize it? And so it's what you consider acting to be. Now, I know that if you're a new actor and you're trying to get on the scene and you're trying to establish yourself, that's probably not going to fly. So back to the original thing, use memory palaces to rehearse the information to the extent right. that you no longer need them. So you're just actually, you can use them, you can build them. But the, can I use the word felicity? That's for happiness, but facility. Felicidad, Felicidad. in Spanish. Yeah, yeah, well, felicity, is, I guess, is Latin. The, the felicific calculus was something that Bentham came up with to talk about. Whatever. Ooh, That's a different topic. Jeremy Bentham. <laughs> I'm now, sorry, I'm going Utility on Utility maximization principle. So I'm, I'm going to do this thing where I go through a lot of questions just really act, super just fast. Act. Acting is awesome. Just Possibly off topic, chronic pain stops concentration, ADHD, chronic pain. That's tough. Most oh, painkillers yeah. cloud your mind. I gave you kombucha for yeah. joint pain. Uh, I struggle with joint pain, yeah. Joint pain. Try kombucha. It's pretty effective. You, you found it pretty effective. Like I said, I've been drugging Anthony since he got here, essentially. And uh, kombucha apparently helped your pain. I think that uh, also with pain, if you can, and with most situations, just get exercise. Just move. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it's it, true. It, it increases endorphins. I'm going to skip the actor questions. Maybe email Anthony well, directly. Yeah, we talked about acting. Yeah. Basically. Memorizing music, key or legend. Let's come back to that. I know Anthony doesn't really believe in speed reading and Jonathan really believes in it. We covered that. It's not about belief. It's not about belief. It's real. It's true. It's been verified with research and so forth. So it's just that I don't use it and it doesn't match my style or anything that I'm really interested in. So I don't want to do it. I want to read slow. I'm reading a new novel right, right now and I'm savoring every yeah. single word. Yeah, yeah. So to speed read this novel would be a disservice to myself right. as a fan of fiction and literature, and it'd be a disservice to the author who spent hours and hours and hours preening that text. So it's not about whether I believe in it or not. I don't need to believe in it. it the verification is there. It's a question of preference. It's a question of purpose. And if I needed to somehow read all kinds of books really fast, he'd be the first guy I go to to help me learn it. But it's not a question of belief. Just, I will say I'm reading right now the entire five book series of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. But I'm reading it at about 500 words a minute, which is significantly slower than I read. But he has so much wonderful prose and brilliant language that I want to enjoy it. So there's nothing wrong with that. But to answer the question, like, Anthony does believe in speed reading, and I do believe in magnetic memory method, which is why we're hanging out in Tel Aviv and recording courses together. Cheers. But I Cheers. want to, like, again, like, sort of this thing. It doesn't have to do with belief. I don't like belief. I like to have things that are verifiable. I'm very empirical. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get on my Dawkins chair here or any of that stuff. <laughs> actually, you know what? Speaking of belief, I was really astounded. The last day that I was in London, I actually went up to, or last night, I went up to Aylesbury. I saw Darren Brown perform his Miracle stage performance. Do you know Darren Brown? I do not. I don't know anything about magic except what you showed me today, which I actually want to talk about. Oh, okay. Well, very briefly, Darren Brown, probably a lot of people watching this know Darren Brown. I saw his Miracle performance and uh, he mentioned Dawkins in a very tongue in cheek sort of way, but he's an atheist. And what he did is he put on a faith healer show and it was, ah. abs and he said, I'm an atheist. And some of you people before he started, he did a bunch of normal mentalist routines. And right. then when the intermission came, he said, when we come back from the intermission, I'm going to do a faith healer routine as an atheist. And if you are religious, if you're an evangelical, if you're Methodist or whatever, no one will be offended if you leave, but we're not going to give you a refund. But uh, yeah, that was his joke. And then he came back and he did a faith healing routine. And it was absolutely astounding. But none of it had anything to do with whether one believes in it or not. The techniques at which he arrived at the miracles that people experience, myself included, they don't require belief because they are completely empirically established. And if anything were to change, science is a self-correcting mechanism that would correct itself in order to explain the phenomenon. So belief, I don't have the paradigm. I don't believe in belief. Well, <laughs> so you had an opportunity. I often talk about this experience of like going on a golf lesson yeah. and the golf instructor thought that we were playing a prank on him, my mm -hmm. then girlfriend and I. Yeah. because he talks and talks and talks. And I asked all these stupid questions and ask questions and ask questions. Wait, can you do that again? Can you do this again? And I'm just dissecting his every move. And then he hands me the club. He's like, try, don't be disappointed if you don't hit the ball. And I hit it and it goes 200 meters. 
And he's like, oh, I get it. You're a golfer. This is like an elaborate. No, it's not an elaborate prank. It's the first time I've ever held a golf club. But you got to experience that today. And I'm actually thinking that I need to build a new lecture into the Super Learner course about basically Tim Ferriss calls it his DISC method, deconstruct, and so on and so forth, right? But you witnessed exactly what happened because Anthony's doing these magic tricks for me, which were supremely impressive, by the way. You should grab a deck of cards and show people. But he's doing, maybe not for the podcast listeners, <laughs> not so, oh my God, yeah, well, I can't see shit. But oh my God, I heard the sound. Of the I heard the there. sound of a queen of hearts. Anyway, <laughs> the and point she is, said, the point is, I literally wouldn't let you do the trick because I was like, wait, okay, right now you're doing this and then you're doing this, but wait, that's happening here. And I'm basically just vocalizing my thought process. But he still didn't see it. I still didn't see it. Even when I in knew, even when I knew what the trick was, it didn't matter because I was so in my head that, I mean, and that's how sleight of hand is designed, but mm-hmm. you got an insight into what my learning process is. And mm-hmm. I want to actually consider building a lecture for super learner which talks about restating the learning in your own words. And it's exactly what you talked about today with the writing, like by asking you those questions, wait, so now that card is still on top. And essentially the reason you're doing that is so you can use your pinky to do this. Yes. Okay. All I want is the yes to confirm my thinking. And I'm trying to flesh out because this is something that I've used to deal with my ADD and my wacky entrepreneur brain. And I realized over the last couple months, I've realized that this is like a super learning technique that I might've developed in and of myself of like Mm -hmm. deconstructing the learning and taking it into my own language and getting you into my framework so that you can teach me how I want to be taught. Yeah. But all that said, you made some mechanical discoveries about subterfuge, about leisure domain, about sleight of hand. But what you said to me instantly was that must have taken you years to learn. Yeah. Because even though I could say, yes, this here, that do, 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 you don't see it because I do this then. And I say that and so forth. At the end of the day, what you learned was revealing, insightful. Mm -hmm. And because you're the kind of person who is so curious, it actually, I think, increased your curiosity and interest in magic much more but a lot of people they will see that and they'll go oh that's all it is right and they'll be disappointed so what i told him was is if i tell you this trick the magician's code is not to never reveal your secrets the magician's code is that if i show you a trick you have to learn one and so i can't wait i hope i learn it in an accelerated fashion do you ever apply grammar from one language to another and it's like the wrong grammar for the wrong language yeah and i think like i go to store now yeah. Oh, yeah. wait, no, I will. Go, I'm going to the store now. Yeah. Sorry. Well, that's actually very helpful. Like, for instance, learning German and then learning to Spanish, uh, m- learning to Spanish, learning to Spanish. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I learned to Spanish. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I mean, what it is actually is that you learn what grammar is in and of itself at a right. higher level. So there's like a meta grammar that happens. Meta grammar. It's meta. actually the same thing that we were just talking about. Mm-hmm. is he looked at my thing. He said, yeah, you're doing this, you're doing that, and you're doing that and so forth. And uh, then I said, yeah, that's what I'm doing. And then he said, that must have taken you years to learn. And the fact of the matter is, is that we learn our own mother tongue after years and years and years. But the difference is, is that what I took years to perfect with my fingers, he can't do that, but he can with magic, but he can do that with grammar very, very easily because as adults, we can understand grammar at a, a totally. much, much higher level. And yet I think what's so interesting about language learning is nobody can articulate the grammatical structure of their native language. I don't even really know what subjunctive case means in English, but I can use it fluently. And I talk to Russian and I'm like, uh, which means I have a problem with the case system. (laughs) And they're like, like, what is this? Padiji system. Like they maybe learned it in school and maybe they don't, but they don't even the concept that there are cases in their language. And if you don't speak either German or Russian, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But the idea that a word has to change because I work with Anthony, as opposed to this is my friend, Anthony, instead of Anthony. And they're just like, Oh, I never thought about that. Yeah. The word changes. Like grammar is this inarticulable 
thing. And it's the reason why you actually have to work with people rather than learn from books and so forth. And ideally not a lover because I had a girlfriend when I was studying Russian. She was actually from Ukraine and she knew uh, Ukrainian and uh, Russian. And she knew exactly all these cases. And the, the thing is that she constantly lecture me on the grammar Spot instead of just speaking with me. Just yeah. speak. Just speak. Speak. Get out there. Well, and that's speak. what I love about Benny Lewis is he's like, just get out there and speak. Like, yeah, but we need to flash that picture on the screen. Benny and I at the last Polyglot conference with Ollie Richards. Uh, if you don't know these guys, go check I haven't him. met him in person. I had him on my show. Yeah, yeah. He's great cool. Guy. He's cool. He's cool. He gave a great talk also and we hung out a bit. Someone answered something uh, oh, or about uh, asked something. Very spice up your imagination? Yeah, without going to an art gallery. So here's the thing, my friend. Yeah. The answer is always in the question. When you say without going to an art gallery, what you really mean is, I don't want to do exactly what I know what's going to help. Sorry, but... Well, no, so for me, no, it's, I, mean, it's, I mean, art gallery, yeah, totally. But time and time and time and time and time again, you look into research about what creates creativity. There is one exercise that comes up everywhere. And it's called the multiple uses exercise. There's another one, which is like, there's two exercises I can think of, and I've done a good bit of research on this. And Dr. Lev has done even more research because he's an engineer and creativity is a key part of his job. One way is you give someone you know, a matchbook and some marshmallows and a small piece of cardboard, and you say, you need to build something that holds this candle on the wall up to 36 inches away from the wall, and we'll do that. You know what I mean? And like, like they said, I do not have the materials to do this. Right. One form of creativity. The other one is say... This is a chopstick. Give me 36 uses for this chopstick. Well, I could use it to pick my nose. I could use it to fight off miniature alien. You know, you come up with these ridiculous answers, but every answer is valid. And what you're doing is you're training your brain to look at things non-linearly. Mm. And for me, pound for pound, this when I was coaching with Dr. Anna, and I was saying, I can't think of markers fast enough. I can't think of vivid enough markers She's like, okay, cool. Here's my water bottle. Or here's my water glass. Here's your empty glass. Here's my empty wine glass. What are 10 uses for an empty wine glass? And invariably, you look at, oh my, <laughs> thank you. You look at the best speed readers. You look at the best memory experts. And actually, I'd be interested to do this with you at some point where it's not high stakes and there's not 160 people watching. But you do this with someone like Dr. Lev who reads 2,000 words a minute with 80% retention. He can give you 30 uses for that. Okay. I could give you probably 20. Okay, but let me get back to my snarky comment. Sure. Sorry. And I mean it actually in, with all love. But when you say without going to an art gallery, for exactly the reasons that he just said is why you go to the art <laughs> gallery. Because when you can use a wine glass for 40 different uses in your mind as a mental exercise, or you can think about how this desk can be a spaceship or whatever, all that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah, this is just, a great spaceship. Just imagine what's going to happen. When you go to your local museum with its dorky photos that the pioneers painted or pictures that the pioneers painted and you start thinking about 80 uses for this painting or a Picasso painting, like, I mean, it takes it to a whole new level because what you're doing is not using a mundane object and thinking about it uh, multiple ways, but you're using an extraordinary object, something that's already extraordinary and thinking about it in extraordinary ways. So w when I hear someone say, how can I spice up my imagination without going to an art gallery? Then I just think, go to an art gallery because for precisely what Jonathan said is the multiple use project, right? right. And what are artists? What is an artist? What is Picasso other than someone who did the multiple use <sighs> exercise yeah, that's true. on antiquity, on African art, on, on shapes, on shapes? I mean, it's just, I'm sorry. I get so sad when someone asks me these things and I've heard it before. How do I do this without doing that? Whenever someone says that, whatever they're trying to exclude is the thing you have to do. And I do it all the time. I'm not preaching from a soapbox. I always think, oh, how do I do this without doing that? And then I push myself to go and do that thing that I'm trying to avoid because that's how you grow. That It's always by identifying where you don't want to go and then going and doing it anyway. It's a total cliche, face the fear, do it anyway. But it is. I didn't want to get on a plane actually to go to uh, Tel Aviv. I didn't want to get on a plane to go to London. So I took the train to London, right? Because right. there was this guy, he had flown a plane and into the mountains like not so long ago and this was bothering me. And I, oh, da, 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 da. And I was just doing mental tricks with myself. Feel the fear and go and do it anyway. And just, 
art galleries, planes, whatever it is, just go live, man. Don't let this mental talk get in your way or resistance get in your way. Uh, just go. And often I find that the answer is in the question and, and it's in the resistance. So, so Dr. Anthony Retivier, our one hour podcast slash live broadcast has run to two hours and oh. Vsept finally got the stream working. <laughs> nice watch. Thank you. We have to go. We don't have to go. I guess we do. But we should you, go. Yeah, I was you. supposed to be somewhere two minutes ago. Okay, well then we better go. We should go. It's a nice little quaint little neighborhood bar. We could go. Anyway, thank you guys for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, I hope it's we, been an honor. I hope, I hope that... Uh, I hope we helped a lot of people. I hope we helped people. I hope we didn't make complete jerks of ourselves. Well, I was just going to say. Actually, I don't mind about that. Uh, yeah, no, that I don't mind. Make a uh, mess. Make a mess. Make a mess. Just get out there and do stuff. But make a mess. If, you know what? I was once at a concert that I really loved, and the guy said at the end of the concert, this was a Jason Mraz concert, not embarrassed, not embarrassed. Mm-hmm. And he goes, I hope you leave here and you have wonderful lives. Whatever beautiful mess you decide to make of it. Yeah. I'm going to make a mess of my life. It's going to be beautiful. Yeah. I only wanted to add is that if we sounded, or if I sounded, I'm not going to speak for him, but if I sounded dogmatic and pedantic, it's just because I'm getting old. And, and we're drinking philosopher juice. <laughs> but it's also, it's also an important lesson, is that we want you to go out and do this stuff on your own. Any Test motion for yourself. creates motion. Yeah. Movement and, uh, is better than stagnation. Right. And it's not because I'm getting old, actually. I do this stuff... When he tells me to try something, I try it. As long as it's not crazy stuff that's obviously self-harming. Yeah, there's no weird stuff. You can't, it's mostly like, hey, I fermented well, you, this under my refrigerator for two you, weeks. You Drink did, it. He you did, you did have something with a weird octopus there. I don't know. I didn't understand it, but it was some, oh, yeah. <laughs> some kombucha. Kind of, some I was like, I ferment of... this under my sink. <laughs> Drink it. It's really good for you. It smells like poison. But, you know, we are talking about... I'm particularly talking about things that have been around for thousands of years Mm -hmm. and people seem above all, they need permission to try it. And I'm not the guy to give you permission to do it. You are. So a lot of the questions, I love them and I answer them to the best of my ability. And I know you do as well, but so much of what I in particular teach is thousands of years old and all that anybody has ever done with any of them is go out and use them, get results improve analyze what you've done analyze again and then teach somebody else exactly and And experiment i think that's one of the biggest take-homes here is apply the method the way that works for you Uh, there's no rigidity if i've learned anything with from working with anthony intensively the last couple days is there's no rigidity to any of this stuff it's rough guidelines also to our life philosophies but also to the memory techniques there are rough guidelines of directions and you should apply them how they work for you. I call them smooth guidelines. Actually. Smooth guidelines. Because rough guidelines are like a wall. And when the wind hits, it has to, like this. But if you have grass, when the wind hits, it just like that. So smooth right. guidelines. Smooth guidelines. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Anthony Mativier. It's been a pleasure and an honor. We hope you guys tune in next time. We'll figure out a way to do it yeah, remotely he's, from he, Berlin. Maybe next time he'll be in Berlin or I'll come back. That's highly likely. I'll uh, informally commit stay to that Stay tuned now. for our next course. We're next doing course, it together. Branding You, How to Build a Multimedia Internet Ecosystem. Yeah. Much love. Thank you very much, guys. Take care. Have a good night. Ciao. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.